What's going on YouTube fam? It's your boy, Nicholas, coming back to the Big Dogs Gotta Eat channel. Just got home from my first day of work. Long ass day. Um, not fantasy football related, unfortunately. Week three just wrapped up in the books, which means another week of me getting my ass kicked in the town get down. Fantasy League is also in the books. Thank you, Brandon Marshall. Thank you, Sammy Watkins. Thank you, Ryan Matthews, especially. Big, big thank you to Ryan Matthews for doing your thing this week, man. I really appreciate all the hard work and effort you put in. Um, also, thank you to my friend who I played, who had Aaron Rodgers, Jordy Nelson, David Johnson, you know, but anyone good that you could probably name that went off this week he had. So, not good for me. Going to be one and two. A lot of you guys are probably freaking out about being one and two, oh and three. I don't think that's an issue this point in the season. I don't think your record is as big of a deal as your overall, you know, your team, how how uh, how well you guys are scoring. You know, if you're putting up a lot of points, you've had a couple unlucky matchups. That stuff will even itself out. I'm not too worried about the record at this point. I am worried about my running backs because I have Ryan Matthews, Jeremy Langford, uh, Rashad Jennings. Um, I forget who else I have, but looks like my middle of the pack running backs worked out worse than if I would have waited on running backs even further, you know, and got guys like Christine Michael, Spencer Ware, Charles Sims, all those zero RB guys that went way deep in the draft looked like they're the lotto picks. Either way, let's get into week three. A uh, couple big injuries. Not anywhere near as many as last week, obviously, because that shit was out of control. But uh, I'm going to give you the top waiver wire pickups for week four. Dudes, you need to be throwing some fab budget on. Um, and uh, some guys that, you know, should have a couple good weeks coming up based on their matchups, based on the opportunity, based on the volume, and based on, I don't know. That's all I got for you. Play that ish. Let's kick this bitch off with this week's top injuries. We have my man's Russell Wilson. Again, this is Monday. I'm taping this Monday night, so the injury report I give you now is just what we have up to date. As of this time, there might be reports that come out tomorrow, Wednesday, Thursday, that are way more in detail and help you out more. So, their analysis. But as of right now, we have a minor MCL sprain for Russell Wilson. You know, he was battling these injuries already. And he tweeted in the game on Sunday, and now um, he is going to be a little more limited, I believe. And uh, I don't know. Pete Carroll and Russell Wilson both said he's fine, and he's gonna, you know, he's gonna, he's expected to play in Week Four. So if I'm a Russell Wilson owner, I'm definitely monitoring that because it has taken a toll on his rushing ability. I think it's a slight downgrade. Uh, to most of the receivers on the team. I think Doug Baldwin is fine regardless of who the fuck's playing quarterback. Dude's a beast. Um, and uh, if I'm Russell Wilson, I'm, I'm, if I'm a Russell Wilson owner, I'm probably looking at the waiver wire to find another suitable uh, pickup. And I'll get into waiver wire pickups in later in this episode. Jeremy Lankford. Uh, at first, you know, he was carted off the field with an ankle injury. News just broke that he's expected to miss four to six weeks. Uh, we saw Langford's role start to diminish last week as Jordan Howard uh, got more involved as the Kadeem Carey. Um, so Langford out four to six weeks. He's on my team in a 10-team league, and it's I'm almost definitely going to be dropping him. Uh, so I think, unless you're in a much deeper league, I mean, he hasn't played well. He hasn't, it's not like he secured the workhorse role and now he got hurt and he should get it back when he gets back. That's not how things went. He didn't play well. He hasn't been playing well. Uh, it started to become a timeshare. So by the time he's back, who knows if he's even going to be getting 45% of the carries anymore. So uh, if I'm a Langford owner in a 10 team league, possibly even a 12 team league, I'm okay with dropping him. So yeah, that's Langford. Next we have Dez who underwent. And MR, I mean, he played the whole game basically. And in the fourth quarter, he tweaked his knee, got an MRI on the knee. Uh, it all came back negative, but 
just, I don't know if they're concerned about it, I guess, for some reason. And they will be running additional tests on it. As of right now, I'm not concerned about Des's uh, playing status until we hear more. Um, so I'm not freaking out about that. But obviously, you know, as they run more tests this week, we'll get a better idea of what's going on. And uh, before I even wrote all the notes for this ep uh, episode, for week four, I saw the news that Shane Vereen uh, tore his tricep. And so uh, it was initially reported that he was going to miss the entire year. And then the Giants put a press release out that didn't specify that he would be missing the entire year. So he's put on the IR, and I believe he can come back in eight weeks. So maybe like week 11 or something like that. I mean, either way, he's not worth rostering. You could drop him in any redraft league. Uh, he's definitely, you could, you could let him go, pick someone else off a waiver wire. So he's out for a very, very large portion of the year. And it's not like, you know, by the time he's back, obviously Rashad Jennings will be there and stuff. So he's not going to get his, uh, like a workhorse role like he had this week. So he's droppable as well. All right. So we ran through the injuries, not a lot of injuries to really cover this week, thankfully, because last week was an absolute fucking bloodbath. So this week, let's get into the waiver wire pickups, obviously. Because that's how you win your damn league. Uh, quarterback position, let's start with the pig skin deliverers. I'm going to start off with my boy Kirk Cousins. Now, obviously he hasn't been great, but you don't need a great actual NFL player to translate into fantasy points. So through the first three weeks of the season, uh, Kirk Cousins only has three touchdown passes. He's been terrible in the red zone. Uh, so, you know, if he improves there, there's definitely hope. Um, but he has been averaging 330 passing yards per game. So if, you know, if, if you get extra points for, for passing yards or something, like my league is 20 yards is a point instead of 25. Obviously, that's more valuable if you get like a 300-yard bonus. That's valuable because he always just puts up the yards because their team's usually trailing. So um, Kirk Cousins puts up the yards. Now they get Cleveland at home which is a ridiculously good matchup for any quarterback. And then they get Baltimore, who we don't even know if they're actually a good team or not because they've had such a weak schedule, even though they're 3-0. So he's someone you could, you know, capitalize on for a short-term gain. Marcus Mariota is the next quarterback on my list. And believe me, I've never been sold on the guy. I don't think he's a great talent. I don't think he's a great quarterback. I was all over the Jameis Winston hype train last year, even after that shitty first week. Um, I think that... Mariota is a good plug-and-play from here on out for the next few weeks at least. They travel to Houston, so obviously you're not going to play him there. But after that, they get to play Miami in Miami. And then they get three consecutive home games against Cleveland, against Indianapolis, and against Jacksonville. Three of the worst defenses in the league. So three home games in a row there. Mariota has a great schedule for that. So um, barring next week, obviously you're not going to grab him. But he's got three great matchups following um, their Houston game. All right, so those are the only two quarterbacks I got for you this week, unfortunately. Uh, let's move over to the wide receivers. First up on my list is your man Terrell Pryor. What a game this dude had. And shouts to fucking Hugh Jackson for coaching his ass off. Like, what they have over there in Cleveland and the way he coached their team, you know, salute. Uh, but Terrell Pryor did his best fucking Bo Jackson impression, man. He was the ultimate athlete on Sunday. He, uh, Caught uh, 10 passes. Yeah, 14 targets. I know he ended up with 144 receiving yards. He dialed in like 35 passing yards and uh, 21 rushing yards and a score. So a huge fantasy day for him. Now, depending on how, you know, whatever site you use for fantasy, like Yahoo or ESPN or whatever, you know, positions him. If he's going to get snaps at quarterback, he's going to be super, super fucking valuable. Like if... If you're going to be able to slot him in as a wide receiver and he's going to keep getting snaps at quarterback, which is probably ideal for the Cleveland Browns, which is ridiculous that they're platooning a quarterback in the NFL. But, I mean, hey, you know what? Whatever fucking – whatever sinks your submarine, I don't know. But uh, he's going to be able to rack up yards all over the place. And, um, you know, obviously Corey Coleman's out for four to six weeks. Josh Gordon will be back in, I think, yeah, week four, week five. So he's got another week of what looks like to be the number one option there. Um, I mean, when Gordon gets back, obviously I see those receiving yards taking a pretty big hit. But, I mean, overall, if they're going to use him at quarterback and let him run from there, if they're going to use him at quarterback and let him throw from there, his upside is 
pretty ridiculous and he could like low key put up some big numbers for you. So I really like Terrell Pryor where they're at. Next up we got Cole Beasley. Um, now, I mean, again, Cole Beasley's not a guy I'm gonna be picking up in my 10 team league, 0.5 PPR or anything like that, but 12 team leagues, um, full point PPR, the dude has at least five catches and I think 65 yards in all three games so far. He is like uh, Dak Prescott's, you know, he is his underneath guy and he's like his favorite weapon right now. We'll have to see what happens with Dez. Obviously, if for some reason Dez gets more tests run on the knee and it comes back that, you know, he has to he has to sit or lose some time or something like that, Colt Beasley's target total will keep, boom, cruising up. And uh, right now he's uh, leading, the, uh, leading the team in targets and I think receiving, maybe not receiving ours, but I think he's up there in receiving ours as well for the team. So Colt Beasley's a guy to, you know, he, he's not a high high ceiling guy, but he has a nice floor there. And he's only 21% owned in Yahoo League, so. Next up, we have Quincy Anunwa, the guy that you've obviously been hearing about on waiver wire lists for the last couple weeks. He's only 34% owned in Yahoo Leagues. And uh, he seems to be someone who's not going away. Um, he saw another 11 targets on Sunday. Didn't do much with the 11 targets. Didn't, uh, he's not much of a threat to score touchdowns, but in PPR Leagues, he's definitely... A uh, good pickup because, um, you know, you see Fitzpatrick relying on him a lot more. Last year it was strictly Decker and Marshall. Now Anunwa's getting in there and he's he's absolutely racking up the targets there. So he's, you know, he, we'd seen it three games in a row. He's consistently getting the targets over and over and over again. That's all you can really ask for for a deep wide receiver. So 12 team leagues again, PPR. He's, he's a guy that needs to be owned, especially if you're a Marshall owner because uh, things are not looking beautiful for him. It ain't the revenue ain't gorgeous right now. I think it'll be fine because he keeps getting the red zone targets, and obviously, eventually those will start falling his way. But Nunwa definitely a guy that needs to be scooped up in most leagues. So let's move over to the position that obviously the waiver wire is known for: the running back position. I talked about Jeremy Langford going out, which leaves Jordan Howard to be the workhorse there. When Langford left uh, on Sunday. Howard was basically the workhorse there. Kadeem Carey was out, so he operated as a three-down back. We saw him rush the ball pretty well. We saw him um, catch four balls, so you know he, he displayed his, his soft hands and he showed that he could be a three-down back. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm sold on the guy as a talent, obviously. He, he broke away for a 36-yard run on his first run, but after that he had eight carries for nine yards. So the stat line itself looks a, bit, a little more padded than it than it really would suggest uh, in terms of how well he actually did. Um, but if I had to say, Jordan Howard is probably this week's top pickup because it's not very often that you get to, you know, pick up a guy off the waiver that is uh, look or at least is prospected to be a workhorse in an offense. Not a great offense, not a great O line, not a great talent, but you know the opportunity will be there, and he should be getting 15 to 20 touches. He's only 23% uh, owned in Yahoo Leagues, and now he gets Detroit, Indianapolis, Jacksonville over his next three matchups. So, I mean, if there's ever a time that he's really going to produce, it's right now against these shitty-ass defenses. Next up, my boy, who I had on my list last week, Dwayne Washington. He's back on the list. Only 23% owned. Y'all didn't pick him up. Uh, we saw him get 10 carries last week, <clears throat> as did Theo Riddick. Unfortunately, Theo, uh, I should say fortunately, I guess for me, because I have him in a lot of leagues, Theo Riddick turned those 10 carries into 9 rushing yards. Dwayne Washington turned his 10 carries into 38 rushing yards. He looked way better. He provided a little spark for the running game, something they were not getting from their running back in Theo Riddick. Uh, Theo Riddick's a terrible in-between-the-tacklers runner, like really fucking bad, like awful. And uh, Dwayne Washington looks like he could provide some, you know, some energy there, some juices to get the juices flowing. Now, I mean, this was a terrible matchup for Detroit, for any rushing offense, I guess, now, because the Packers look like a legitimate run-stopping team. The number one rush defense in the NFL right now, allowing fucking 1.8 yards a carry to opposing rushers. So, Dwayne Washington's 3.8 yards a carry, while in, in a vacuum doesn't look well, against a defense letting up 1.8 yards per carry is pretty fucking good. So, uh, now he gets a juicy-ass matchup against Chicago, which should be way better for him. He should continue to see early down work, and if 
Detroit is not, if Mr. Cooter is not absolutely retarded, he's going to look at those 10 rushes that the Riddick had for nine yards and give at least half of those to Dwayne Washington. He's, he's going to continue to get the goal line work. Uh, he is a good pass catcher, as I said. He was a wide receiver converted into a running back, so it's not impossible to think that he's going to get... He, he saw a few targets in this game, so if he can add on two or three catches along with maybe 12 to 15 carries, he could have some absolute, you know, really some really good value there uh, for someone that's like pretty highly unknown. Like I said, 23% owned in Yahoo League. Next up, we have the boy out in Baltimore, the Baltimore boy, Kenneth Dixon. Now, he's the rookie. Um... And he was injured, or he still is injured. It, when the injury occurred, the knee injury, they expected him to be out for the first four weeks. Which means if things go correct, things go right, he's going to be out next week and then hopefully returning in week five. Uh, and this is, <clears throat> you know, it's a backfield that's absolutely up for taking because neither Terrence West or Justin Forsett, while they're getting even splits, neither of them has even touched. The team is 3-0. And neither of those running backs has even touched a double-digit fantasy performance yet this year. Three games, neither of them has hit 10 points yet. Clearly, they, they're in need of a running game, and uh, Kenneth Dixon could absolutely be that guy. He, he showed in college he could be a three-down workhorse, and uh, now's the time to grab him because you don't want next week to go by, and then the reports come out that, hey, Kenneth Dixon's coming back this week. Now everyone's obviously rushing to the wire. So get him now while he's still... A, very highly available in most of your leagues and uh, stash him and hopefully within you know three four weeks when he's fully back and he's fully healthy he could take over that workhorse role which could be super valuable on a team that might have a good defense like Baltimore you know their defense looks pretty good so if they can stick to you know a ferocious defensive game they're probably going to look to ground and pound and uh, Kenneth Dixon like I said he could he could do the in between the tackles he could catch the ball he's, he's a good athletic back and if he could uh, you know, show a little bit of the talent when he gets back, he could easily take over that workhorse role. So grab him now while you can. All right, so let's move over to the tight end position. And we're getting a little resurgence. Welcome back to 2014. We got my boy Jimmy Graham posting a six catch, 100 yard, one touchdown performance. Just first 100 yard performance since I believe like week 16 of 2014. That's a lie, actually. I think he put one up last year too, but I, either way, it was, you know, it's good to see him back. And all those reports of how we haven't seen any players come back from the injury that he had, the patella tendon or whatever, those look to be obsolete because we see Jimmy Graham playing well, we see Victor Cruz playing well, so that's not, you know, that's not obviously the president going forward. And people can come back from that injury. He looked really good, really athletic, soaring up for balls, safety outlet, going deep, um, looking to be a favorite target of Russell Wilson. So he's someone that you absolutely want to grab. He's highly owned already. He's owned in like 70% of leagues. But if you're in one of those leagues that he's not owned in, definitely hop on that now. They get the Jets next week, who was just uh, fucking demolished by Travis Kelsey on Sunday. Uh, and, you know, Jimmy Graham and Travis Kelsey are very similar in the type of, uh, you know, talent they bring to the field. So it's... It's definitely a possibility Jimmy Graham has back-to-back -back big weeks. Uh, they have a bye, and then I think they get... Uh, hold on, let me check. Bye, and then they get Atlanta. It sucks, obviously. Arizona, tough defense. Didn't look great on Sunday. Uh, and then they get New Orleans. So pretty easy schedule for him coming up. The healthier he gets, the better he's going to get, and the more involved in that game he's going to get. So Jimmy Graham, lock it up. Next up, we have... Zachary Miller, the number one fantasy tight end for week three, uh, posted, I think, eight catches, 78 yards, and two tutties on nine targets. Um, didn't do great in the beginning of the year, but I think this switch up at quarterback might help him with Brian Hoyer there because he looked like he's the safety valve there. Uh, but Jay Cutler is expected back, but I think Zach Miller will continue to increase his role in this offense. I'm excited to see what he can do because... You know, he is athletic, and he proved last year that he could do good things over a stretch. He was like a top five, top ten tight end over the last five weeks of the season, and that, that was because he, you know, he put up games like, like he did on Sunday, and he's capable of doing that. And again, the next three fucking games are Detroit, Indianapolis, Jacksonville. Like, it doesn't get any easier than that. All right, the last tight end on my list is Kyle Rudolph. I fucking hate Kyle Rudolph. Sorry. 
Uh, Kyle Rudolph. Literally, like on every, he's on a, someone has a breakout list of tight ends every off. He's been a potential breakout for like ten years in a row now. I don't even know how old the guy is. Uh, but this is third game in a row. He's gotten at least eight targets. It's back to back games with a touchdown, and Bradford clearly loves him at the tight end position. So whenever Stefan Diggs can't get open, Rudolph is the number two target there easily. We had Laquan Treadwell's not even playing. Uh, we haven't seen much out of Charles Johnson, you know, so he's the clear number two option in the passing game there. And uh, Bradford seems to be super comfortable with him, especially as a red zone target. So he he's actually tight end two right now in fantasy behind Greg Olson. So uh, he's something that I, I, I'm not sure the ceiling is crazy high, but if he's going to continue to get eight targets a game, his floor is going to be pretty nice, especially in a Minnesota Vikings Team that looks to be the real, the real Shrilla deal. Now I want to do a little section called keeping it a hunted, a hunted emoji. And this is just guys that are highly owned, but need to be owned in 100,000% of leagues. Because it's just ridiculous that they're not owned. Jarek McKinnon, only 67% owned. He outsnapped, he outplayed, and he outperformed Matt Asiata. So if there's any questions about a split backfield, I think they were answered. And uh, as we see this Minnesota Vikings team become elite, they're going to be looking to rely on their defense as well as a ground game to win games because that's the formula for success. If you have a good defense, you're able to run the ball or you're at least looking to run the ball. So McKinnon's only owned in 67% of leagues. Needs to be owned in 100. Christine Michael, 72% owned. That fucking blows my mind that he's, he's available in 30% of leagues. Especially after last week, we learned Thomas Rawls was going to be out. And now Thomas Rawls actually has a... Oh, wow, I didn't even talk about that in the injuries. Well, now I'll talk about it. Thomas Rawls has a... I see a big-ass spider coming down my motherfucking ball. Wait on I gotta go kill this thing. I'll be right, I'll be right back. To goat lay. Oh, where did you fucking go? Oh, shit. I found you. Oh fuck, I didn't get it. Alright, well, sleeping tonight should be fun. Uh, so, yeah, Christine Michael is owned in 72% of the leagues. We just found out Thomas Rawls has a hairline fracture. Who knows how long he's going to be out. Uh, he was already injured coming into the year. Now he's re injured. Like, you literally don't even know if you're going to see Thomas Rawls again this year. I mean, I'm sure he will be back eventually, but for right now, this is Christine Michael's backfield for the taking. He looked amazing on Sunday. Obviously, he was versus the 49ers defense, but, you know, he shot out of a cannon, quote-unquote. 41-yard touchdown run right off, off the fucking rip. Plunged in again for another tutty. Uh, huge performance from Michael. He looks really good. He looks legit. Uh, every offseason report was the real deal. He will be leading that backfield for sure going forward, uh, and that's obviously never a bad thing in fantasy to own a piece of the Seattle Seahawks back field. I almost expect Marshawn Lynch-esque numbers for Christine Michael going forward as long as Thomas Rawls is out. He'll get almost all the early down work, all the goal line work, and he'll lose some passing down work, but I mean, he's he's a locked and loaded high-end RB2 going forward, if not an RB1. Lastly, we have Philip Dorsett, who is the wide receiver 2 in Indianapolis right now because Dante Moncrief's obviously out. Now, he had a shitty game on Sunday, I understand this, and I Honestly, I'm not quite sure that Moncrief's injury really helps Dorsett because Dorsett's a slot guy, and him playing on the outside is not like his strong suit. Uh, but as long as he's the second wide receiver on this team, I think that he'll be able to put up numbers at least in the next two games because they go against Jacksonville and then they go against Chicago. And uh, this last Sunday, Dorsett played in every single snap that was a two wide receiver set. So he's going to be on the field the whole time, and I think better games are... Obviously going to come for him with Andrew Luck as their quarterback. So that kind of wraps up my free agent waiver wire pickups. Uh, my two highly prioritized players would definitely be um, Jordan Howard, Dwayne Washington. Oh, I also forgot to mention while I was kind of talking about Kenneth Dixon as the guy you want to pick up because he's going to be coming back from injury. Tyler Eifert also falls into that category. I mean, obviously he was drafted in probably every league. Very highly owned, uh, but if he happened to be dropped in one of your leagues, 
He's uh, limited at practice now. Well, at least that's what the report said today. They didn't actually practice, but if they did, he would have been limited, which means it's good because he's back on the field and he's getting some reps, um, and he'll be back sooner rather than later. So it's time to pick up Eifert because that Cincinnati offense badly needs some weapons on passing downs. You know, uh, Geo hasn't been great, and A.J. Green is the only thing they got going there. So Tyler Eifert, another guy that you want to grab now before he finally gets back on the field and everyone wants to grab him. All right, so that's going to wrap that up. Um, if there was any other guys that I missed, like the injuries and shit, let me know, and I'll, uh, I guess I'll just give, well, I don't know, I'll give you my opinion on them or whatever. You'll be able to see more reports. I have to, I have to do this on Monday because if I wait till Tuesday, obviously, I won't, I won't be home till work. I won't be home from work till like 7.30, and then like if I try to shoot the video, upload the video, and like let YouTube pro it fucking well, I don't know what the hell what like YouTube is doing, but it takes like an hour for them to process videos before you can upload them. So I have to upload this to iMovie, then edit it, and then edit upload it to YouTube, and then let that process. So the whole process takes forever. And obviously, if I get home from work at 7:30, do all that. Like by the time this video's up, it's gonna be like 10 or 10:30 on Tuesday night, and like that's too late for you guys to see who you need to pick up on the waiver wire. So. Um, so I'm gonna get these out Monday. I mean, this should be done like processing Monday night, and I might just schedule it. You could like schedule a time for them to come out. So I might just schedule it for Tuesday, like Tuesday, maybe like 10 a.m. or some shit. So you guys have all day to to watch it, hopefully, and see it, and we do whatever you gotta do. Cause I don't care. And that's all I gotta say to y'all. And if anyone is wondering about our softball team, we fucking suck. We're like 0 and 10. I missed last game because I went out. And uh, I woke up in Chinatown in New York City. It was a wild ass night. It was fun though. <clears throat> but yeah, we missed that game. <laughs> missed that big time. We got our asses whooped again. But yeah, man, as always, if you enjoyed the video, give me that thumbs up. Hit that subscribe button. Share it, like it, and do whatever you gotta do to help the big dogs go global. We're global in this hoe. Yeah, so give that up. Give us a follow on Twitter at BDGE underscore fantasy FB. It'll be on the screen, and if you want to follow my personal shit, I'll put that below in the description, like Snapchat, Instagram, all that, whatever, whatever, whatever. And, um, yeah, you can ask me questions on Twitter, put some shit in the comment section, I don't care, I'll get back to you, hopefully. That's it, good night. I'm tired as shit, I woke up at 5 a.m. today. We all, so I need to crash. Next episode.